Hey, Michael, how are you doing today? Are you able to hear me? Michael, can you hear me? I'm not able to hear you, Michael, if you're saying anything. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. I'm doing well on yourself. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm glad that you can make it. Uh, well, good to be here. Uh, um, where are you located again? DC. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Refresh my memory. Have we spoken before? Did we speak last time? I don't think so. Okay. All right. Well, um, while we're waiting to see if, if anyone else shows up, um, I do like to um, know a little bit about the background of people who attend these webinars, um, what experience do they have in real estate investing? And so why don't you tell me what um, experience you have, if any, in real estate investing? Uh, well, to be honest, very little. <laughs> All right. Well, um, then um, that will help um, guide my, <laughs> my presentation um, this evening. Um, I'll go over uh, some of the basics when it comes to real estate investing in general. Um, and then we'll um, talk about out-of-state real estate investing specifically. Um, and then we'll end with um, why um, invest in Detroit and what type of um, uh, benefit okay. can the um, can the BNIC network um, bring you in um, your uh, effort for out-of-state investing. Um, mm -hmm. And so you're in, in D.C., to where, what's the average price for a house out there? Actually, I'm not quite sure. I'm thinking that the average is somewhere close to 450 to 500. Okay. That sounds about yeah. comparable to where I am in California. I'm in North LA County. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Down in the basin of LA, you know, the average price for a house is, you know, 800 going close to a million dollars. Right. Ooh. And so you'll, you'll, you'll see when we start going through some numbers, how it becomes almost impractical at that point. When we, when we look at the rent for, um, for, um, when the house costs that when much, the house costs that just much. can't make it cash flow. Just can't make it cash flow. Yeah, so, so uh, just out of curiosity with um, the increase in um, interest payments or increase in the, um, in the fair rate, has that really put a damper or anything in Detroit? Um, um, no. To not the subject that uh, we, deal we deal in. So we deal so near we the deal bottom of the value, value chain, where the average property mm -hmm. costs fifty thousand dollars. So we don't really, so use, we finance. Don't really use finance. Right. Ah, uh, so, okay. So, yeah. yeah. It, it, it hasn't, it, it, it um, hasn't changed um, or impacted what we do at one bit. Hmm. Okay. So, in fact, in fact, let me let me jump in right now. Jump in right now, and let's get started. Let's get you're started. hearing an echo. You're hearing an echo. Hold on, just a second. 
Do, 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 do. Oh, wait a minute. That's not working. Is the echo still there? Let's see. Testing, testing. Nope, I don't hear it anymore. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, let's jump into it. Uh, so this is a webinar on um, out-of-state uh, real estate investing, and it's a strategic approach for enhanced um, returns. So tell me, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm um, president of a couple of companies. Um, uh, help keep my money, um, LLC and um, the BNIC Network, LLC. I graduated from well Marymount University with a degree in economics. I've got over 30 years of professionally developing and managing complex operational and financial management systems, mainly for the government, um, in the tune of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars on an annual basis. I spent four years as um, the CFO for Santa Barbara County's Behavioral Health Department, where I developed and managed $106 million annual budget. And once I started my own consulting company, I, I spent two years as a contract CFO for um, a nonprofit in Santa Barbara, where I managed um, an $11.5 million endowment fund. I also have been a real estate investor since 1997, personally owned three properties. I have never, ever put a penny of my own property into um, any of the properties that I've um, owned. And I actually got paid $15 to buy my first property. But that is a story for another day. All right. So we're going to focus on two things. So the first is we're going to cover some real estate investment banks on basics. Um, we're going to talk about cash on cash return, um, or what they call cash on cash ROI, and then we're going to talk about cash flow, and then we're going to talk about the advantages of out of state investment opportunities. And I'm going to start with a short video from um, this guy. Have you ever heard of BiggerPockets.com? You said bigger pockets? Yeah, bigger, B I G G E R, pockets. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, this is the guy who started um, biggerpockets.com. It's been around forever. And I just want to make sure that I'm sharing my sound. So, give me one quick minute. Were you able to hear that sound? Yes, sir. Okay. So there we have only about a minute video. Real uh -huh. <laughs> Per unit. So now, the question one that I just got on a webinar is what if the actual dollar amount looked pretty good? Like, a, a cheap, like, let's say I was getting $200 on, uh, on a single family house, we'll call it, right? Let's say I was making 200 bucks. But I was only getting a 5% return. Would I do that? Great question. So here's, what, here's what, how I look at that. If I'm just getting started and I'm trying to buy my very first home, and I'm only doing a five percent return, and I know I have more money in that from, I would probably do it just to start building momentum, as long as I was really confident in that number. Because I believe in the beginning, momentum is more important than your actual return on a single investment. The knowledge is the game. 
Now that said, I would I would normally say the cash on cash return number, the percentage is more important than your dollar amount. Now, why do I have two of those numbers? It's because without using both those metrics, you can manipulate it. For example, what if I had a property that was making me two hundred dollars per month, but it cost that fits my metric, right? But it cost me ten million dollars to buy that property. That would be a horrible deal, right? So that would be a super low, like 0.0001 percent cash cash return. Now, on the other hand, what if I had a property that was giving me a fifty percent return on investment? Whoa, that's really good. But that just might mean I put two dollars into the deal. It was an almost a no money down deal, and I made back only a dollar the entire year. I was making back like eight cents a month. That's a horrible deal, right? I don't want to make eight cents a month. That's why I want both these things. Now, generally speaking, I care more about my percentage return than I do my cash flow number, but I would like to have both those hit my metric. But again, I would be willing on an early deal just to build momentum to go a little bit lower than that. So I hope that helps uh, answer that question. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you give me the thumbs up below the video. And uh, I guess follow me, uh, you know, us, Bigger Pockets on everywhere at Bigger Pockets and me personally at Beardy Brandon over on Instagram. Thanks, y'all. All right, so let's jump right into it and talk about um, cash and cash ROI. So he explained what, um, well, he really didn't explain what cash up on cash ROI is, right? It's a mathematical um, equation. And so is when you take the annual pre-tax cash flow and you divide it by the total cash invested and you multiply that by a dollar. So the annual pre-tax cash flow is a net income that a property generates in a year after operating expenses and mortgage payments, but before taxes. And then your total cash invested includes the initial down payment, closing costs, and renovations or repair costs, um, paid in cash, it's the actual um, cash that you come out of your pocket. So we're going to use two examples. So I live in Lancaster, California. Average house up here is about uh, half a million dollars. And um, that house will rent for about $3,000 a month. So if you're going to finance that house, and you're going to only have to put down um, 20%. Even though on investment properties, you generally need to put down a little bit more, but keep the numbers simple. We'll say you put down 20%. So that's $100,000 plus closing costs are another 10,000. So you'd be out of pocket $110,000 total cash invested. And in this scenario, we're um, assuming you don't have to do any renovations or nothing like that. And then you rent it for um, $3,000. Well, in order to calculate what your annual pre-tax um, cash flow is, um, let's calculate it first on a monthly basis, just get an idea of what it's going to be. We're going to take that $3,000, and first thing you're going to do is you're going to subtract that mortgage payment, right? So you get that principal and interest, um, which is um, at the time we did this, Mortgage rates were around um, 7%. So that'd be around 2661 per month. And that's before we get into taxes, insurance, and property um, management costs. And so you will quickly see that at $3,000 a month, that your cash on cash um, is going to be negative. And here's an important factor. Mike, if you don't get anything else out of this, here is a cardinal rule. Never, ever, ever invest in a buy and hold property if it has negative cash flow. There will be people who will try to say, oh, man, we're, we're betting on appreciation. Well, there were people who in 2007 bought houses in California and bet on appreciation also. And in 2008, they got wiped out. And so um, 
I'm just telling you from a risk management perspective, if it doesn't cash flow from day one, walk away from it. There's too many opportunities throughout the United States of properties that will cash flow from day one. Unfortunately, along, along the coast, both West Coast and East Coast, most properties will not cash flow positively. They're just too expensive compared to the rents that you can charge. So let's look at a Detroit example. A Detroit example, $48,000 for the house, $2,000 for closing costs. So you're all in $50,000. Um, that's acquisition and rehab. Um, and that house will rent for around $1,000 a month. Well, now you take that $1,000 and you minus operating costs of $375. And the $375 is actually kind of high. Okay. But for the ease of, of calculating our numbers, we're going to use $375. These were $625 a month, which is $7,500 a year. That's your um, annual um, pre tax cash flow. Well, when you divide that by the $50,000 and you multiply that by 100, you get 15%. 15%. So that is your cash on cash return. Um, now, that is from holding a piece of real estate in Detroit as a landlord, collecting um, rent, using a professional property management company to handle all that for you. That's included in the, in the um, 375, um, paying your property taxes, paying the insurance, right? Um, that 15% uh, beats the average annual return on the stock market. Now, year to date, stock market is doing pretty well, right? But we look back a couple of years ago, stock market wasn't doing too well. Um, so, the fact that Detroit out of the box on a $50,000 investment can generate you 15% cash on cash return. What do you think about that, Mike? Yeah, sounds good so far. All right. So you know, that's the number one reason for investing out of state, especially if you live on, on one of the coasts is the higher cash on cash ROI. So now let's look at some other reasons. Lower cash investment. So in California, um, the average home as of last month, the medium home price was $860,300. Um, in Florida, it was four fifteen, dollars In Texas, it's three forty. dollars Again, in the segment, of Detroit that we focus on, it's $50,000 all in acquisition and rehab. Now, unless you've got 860,000 in cash or those other amounts in cash, you're gonna to need to borrow some money. And so again, we're gonna use 20% down, 2% on closing costs, which means in California, you're still gonna need around $200,000 in cash. Florida, you'll need about 100,000 Texas, 75,000. Again, Detroit, 50,000 with no mortgage. So we use a common denominator of 200,000 roughly. And let's see what you get for $200,000 in cash. So in California, you get one house, but that one house is only going to get you about $4,000 in rent. And then you got to subtract out the mortgages before you even get into operating costs. In Florida, they'll get you two houses that generate you about $3,000 a month each. So you get $6,000 in rent. A little more rent. Um, and But you still got um, those mortgages. Um, in Texas, uh, they'll get you two um, houses, $4,000 in rent. Um, but you still have $50,000 left over. But the beautiful thing about in Detroit is it'll get you four houses, 
thousand dollars a month with no mortgages. And so that's the other beautiful thing about investing out of state when you live on the coast is um, a significantly lower um, cash investment. Any questions so far, Mike? I have no questions so far. Right. And, um, so you did say no mortgage for it? Correct. No mortgage. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so this, this assumes a $50,000 cash investment. Gotcha. Okay. Now, because you're investing out of state, which means it's not easy to go visit your property, you're gonna, you are gonna need to have some better uh, money management skills. Um, you're gonna have to have some tools and strategies for managing out of state um, properties. Um, number one thing is you gotta have reliable boots on the ground. Um, it took my company two years to um, establish the right relationships in Detroit. Um, especially coming from California, because unfortunately, um, Detroit being as beaten down economically as it's been for decades, uh, when they saw California money coming in, um, their eyes got big. And unfortunately, um, they had um, short visions, not long-term visions. And it was all about making quick money and not you know, um, establishing relationships for the long term. And I will say this to anybody from Detroit, Detroit is a city of hustlers. And if you are not careful, you will get hustled and you won't even know that you're being hustled. And so um, the number one thing is finding reliable boots on the ground. And then as you grow your portfolio, unless you wanna be a portfolio manager full time, you're gonna need somebody to manage that portfolio for you. Um, remote, property management services. Um, whatever property management company that you choose, um, it's important that they have um, great systems in place. Uh, and probably the most important system is the communication system. Communication system with yourself, communication system uh, with the residents, communication systems with their maintenance staff. Um, and uh, you need to have a good uh, communication system with your rehabbers, right? Communications is the number one thing um, because you're not there on a day-to-day -day basis to oversee things. Um, there are some um, cost benefits to using uh, what they call prop tech, which is prop uh, property technology, uh, whether it's um, cameras and those type of things, especially during... Um, the rehab um, process. Um, and um, we've talked about um, the financial planning. We've talked about cash on cash ROI. But the next thing is the rent to price ratio. And so the rent to price ratio is um, the number one ratio that we look at in identifying, uh, first and foremost, if a market is worth um, evaluating. And so these were the best rent to price ratios. Um, and, and all the rent to price ratio is, is what's the monthly rent divided by the average sales price. And what that tells you is for every dollar that you invest, um, how much rent is it generating for you? And so the higher the percentage, uh, the more effective it is as a, um, as a cash generating machine. And so when you look at this list, you'll notice they are either all in the South or they're all in the Midwest, right? Jackson, Mississippi is number one. It's the only one that's above um, 3.0. And then we go into Montgomery. Um, Baltimore is on the East Coast. Um, Baltimore is an outlier. Um, but then we got um, Toledo, um, Detroit, Cleveland, uh, Shreveport, um, Dayton, uh, Kansas City, and um, Peoria. Um, I would say outside of um, Detroit City proper, um, Ohio in general is the second best market in the United States. Um, and so uh, even though Detroit shows number five on here, 
there are specific zip codes in Detroit that um, we really, really uh, focus on. All right, now we get into um, better risk management, especially because um, one of the things that can happen is out of sight, out of mind, um, especially when things are going great and you're receiving that check um, each month by clockwork, it's easy to um, not forget about the things that you should be doing, like semi-annual um, inspections um, and those type of things, right? And we already talked to you about how it's um, easier to get hustled um, out in um, Detroit. Um, diversif diversification um, is a good risk management strategy, spreading your money over more properties. So what we saw is with you know that $200,000, if you have in cash, you only get one property in California, uh, two properties in Florida. Um, I think it was three properties in Texas, but you can get four properties all cash in uh, Detroit. So not only is it a lower cash investment, but um, you're able to um, spread your cash over more um, properties um, and diversification is a great risk management strategy. Uh, but you do need to understand the legal and regulatory uh, considerations in each um, state and which um, jurisdictions are landlord friendly versus um, tenant friendly. Um, so in California, very tenant friendly. And we have some cities that are extremely, extremely tenant friendly. Um, Detroit, the court systems since COVID have turned more tenant friendly. And so because of that, we've had to change some of our strategies. Um, and this really is where the relationship with the property management company that we use, which is Great Lakes Property Management, comes into play. They've been doing this since 06. They have more than 300 properties uh, under management, mainly for out-of-state investors. Um, and they focus on the lower end of the value chain, um, section eight uh, properties. And because of COVID, they no longer recommend entering into one year leases with cash paying tenants. Here's the reason why. Because if a cash paying um, tenant during the year decides that they're not gonna pay anymore and you have to take them through the eviction process, the courts are now very lenient and they will give them multiple opportunities to um, and extensions before you actually get that eviction notice. And so you may spend three, four, or five months in court proving that the tenant's not making an effort to pay their rent before you can actually evict them. Um, versus if you have a month to month um, lease, um, then they don't have that same um, leniency because, hey, your month is up, it's time to go. Um, so, that was a strategy that they learned uh, after COVID. Um, and then of course, you wanna always make sure that you're properly insured. And so we're mainly talking about landlords insurance um, because what insurance does is it shifts the risk away from you as the landlord, shifts it to the insurance company. You pay a premium um, for that. Um, so that's one way of uh, protecting against unforeseen expenses. The other way is setting aside money into a reserve account. And we specifically put money into a reserve account each month um, to cover uh, maintenance costs, to cover a um, vacancy rate. So when the property becomes vacant, uh, now you have what are called turnover costs. Turnover costs are basically preparing the property for the next tenant, right? You got to repaint it. Uh, you may have to um, get new flooring, 
Um, hope, the hopefully the tent hasn't done any serious damages um, to your um, property, um, but there's almost always some turnover costs associated with um, with a um, vacancy. And then the, um, the other thing that you put reserves um, aside for are capital expenditures. Um, those have to do with replacing the systems of the house. So the roof, um, the piping system, the electrical, <clears throat> the major systems of the house, the water heater, um, the HVAC, right? What we call CapEx. Um, and that is the conclusion of this first part. And so we went over the real estate um, investment basis. We talked about cash on cash ROI and um, the importance of that and cash flow. Cardinal rule, um, never invest in anything that has negative cash flow. And we talked about the advantages of out-of-state investment opportunities, uh, higher cash on cash ROI, uh, lower uh, cash investments, um, but you do need better money management um, skills and better risk management skills. So, any questions so far? Uh, no, qu actually, one question. Um, are these uh, single units or? So, the basics that I went over um, today um, apply to uh, what's called single family residential. But mm -hmm. single family residential is one to four units. So it covers That's single. Cool. So it covers, you know, um your 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 regular, you know, one um uh, what what we call single family, but duplexes, triplexes, all the way up to quads. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. And just um out of curiosity, the um, have you noticed um, a spike in insurance premiums over the last few years? Um, so in, in Detroit, we were expecting a, a significant increase in our insurance premiums, but we didn't see them. Um, and um, Detroit also has a, a special um, program specifically for landlords. Um, where you can basically get just liability insurance for um like forty dollars a month. Mm -hmm. Um and and then it's a matter of you know um your your fire insurance, right? That's that's your other thing. And um believe it or not, a lot of landlords just roll the dice <laughs> when it comes to the fire insurance. I don't recommend it. I do I not recommend that. Um, now, once you get, you know, to a certain size and your reserves get to a certain size, then, then yeah, then you can start, um, you know, taking um, a higher level of risk um, because unless, you know, if you have a portfolio of, um, of um, 100 homes in um, Detroit, but do you have enough in reserves to replace 10 at one time? Um, then you're you're basically at that point almost like self-insured. And there's some you know, self-insurance programs and models that you can run um, and, and where it makes more sense then to say, hey, I've got enough set aside and I can invest those funds where it's more cost effective than me continuing to pay on insurance um, uh, policies mm -hmm. and paying insurance uh, premiums. But when you start off, oh, you definitely want to go ahead and and pay um, those, you know, get, get the minimum insurance that's required um, for you to cover your, um, your, your liability insurance and to be able to, you know, if there is a um, disaster, mm -hmm. um, to be able to, um, that you're not, you know, totally out of, out of your, you know, the hard money that you put into it. Does it make sense? 
Yes, sir. All right, so let me jump right on in to the second one, which is um, we've, we've already covered this, right? Why becoming uh, a real estate investor? But why invest in Detroit? So from our um, perspective, and we've done analysis of every single zip code in the United States, and we believe that Detroit, specifically the city of Detroit proper and five specific zip codes, that Detroit is the best single family rental market in the United States. It's also one of the fastest appreciating real estate markets in the United States. In January of this year, it was actually uh, classified as number one and beat out um, Miami, um, Dade, um, Florida, um, as far as um, fastest appreciating um, metros. Uh, here's what I can tell you from just practical experience. We started looking at investing in Detroit in 2021. So the typical housing stock in where we invest in is three bedrooms, one bath, about a thousand square feet, um, built in the 40s or 50s, right? Old houses. Um, and three years ago, three and a half, uh, you could have bought a property and rehabbed it all in for $25,000. And you could have rented that house for $500 a month. Your rent to price ratio would have been 2%. Flash forward three and a half years, and that same property will now cost you about $50,000 all in and rents for about $1,000. So it's doubled in value and it's doubled in rent in about three, three and a half years. I don't know of any other market that's done that in the last three and a half years. And so even though the West Coast and the East Coast historically have been looked at as the you know, fastest appreciating markets in the um, Midwest has always been looked at as the best uh, cash flowing markets, um, COVID threw a monkey wrench in that. Um, so when you add up, when you take COVID and you add on 2008 and the fact that we didn't build houses um, hardly anywhere um, and the demand for housing uh, keeps outstripping um, supply, um, house appreciation is up everywhere, okay? And so um, people are just now catching on though about the sweet spot of Detroit, okay? So I'm from Southern California, been here since 1989 when I went to college. And the inner city of Detroit is much like what LA was after the LA riots in 1992. And the inner cities of um, LA and the surrounding areas um, blew up in appreciation and development after that time. And so um, Detroit is, um, the inner cities of Detroit um, is poised to do the exact same thing um, because they just um, rebuilt their um, downtown. And so you can see the picture of the skyline of a brand new downtown, brand new riverfront, um, mainly built by um, the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I always forget his name. But um, have you ever heard of, of uh, Opportunity Zones? Yes, sir. Don't know a whole lot about them, but I've heard of them. So President Trump created the Opportunity, or signed the Opportunity Act in 2017 that created Opportunity Zones and Opportunity Funds in 2018. The um, Detroit went through the largest municipal bankruptcy at the time in 2013 and came out at uh, 2014, 2015. 
the head of their planning department um, led a charge, white guy, led a charge um, called Rebuild Detroit, in which he um, had um, developed this whole plan on how to rebuild um, Detroit. And so once Trump signed the uh, Opportunity Act and state governors could assign um, parcels and entire um, housing tracts or you know just tracts as uh, opportunity zones, Detroit basically designated their entire downtown as an opportunity zone. And what happened is the planning director for the city of Detroit quit in 2018. He created six or seven opportunity funds that raised $150 million the first year. And he became a developer overnight because he knew exactly where all the development was going to take place because he's the one who put together the plan. And he basically um, led the um, Cleveland Cavaliers owner to buying up um, almost all the property in downtown Detroit for pennies on the dollar, um, mm. sold it off, redeveloped it, um, built new um, skyscrapers, office towers, uh, sports facilities, um, quick and mortgage, um, moved their um, headquarters there and turned it to Rocket Mortgage, other financial services companies um, soon followed. Um, and um, and and so Detroit, brand new downtown. And here's the thing that we um, know about white folk. White folk, up until the pandemic, wanted to live close to where they were. And so mm -hmm. what did they do? They started um, gentrifying the mid area, um, the area right next to downtown. But then they skipped over the inner city and jumped to the suburbs beyond eight mile and left the inner city alone. Now, Detroit is one of the most um, impoverished inner cities that exist in the United States. There is a single um, government entity that owns more than 70,000 vacant lots and boarded up homes is the Detroit Land Bank Authority, where you can go onto their website right now. Again, Detroit Housing, uh, I, mean, I mean, the uh, Detroit Land Bank Authority. And with your credit card and $1,000, you can bid on buying a house right now. And it's that simple. That's how many vacant lots and boarded up homes that they have. And at one time, it was over 100,000. Okay. Um, but in the, the last couple of years, people have become wise, mm -hmm. right? Um, especially knowing that there's not enough Section 8 housing in Detroit. I read an article that said Detroit has issued, I think, like 10,000 vouchers, Section 8 vouchers, but there are only like 8,000 um properties in Detroit that are taking Section 8 vouchers. And there's a years-long waiting list to get on um to um receive any further vouchers. So um there's a huge need for it. So why work with us? Um the BNIC network. So first of first first and foremost we manage all aspects of the real estate deal, from finding the property, managing the acquisition, going through the escrow process. We handle um, deal negotiation. Um, once you close on uh, escrow, um, we develop the scope of work for any type of rehab. We manage the rehab process. We deal with the uh, rehabber uh, once the rehab is done. Um, we get with the property management company to get a tenant put in there, um, and preferably Section 8, even though legally you cannot discriminate. But 
again, Great Lakes Property Management, we've been doing this now for 18 years. They have one of the best um, screening techniques um, where they will, um, I can't say guarantee, that they're going to, you know, do their best effort to make sure you get a Section 8 tenant. Um, so we handle um, all of that. Um, and then once the property um, has been um, placed with a tenant, uh, we stay on for the um, next year and uh, we continue to manage the whole process, make sure the property management company is doing what they're doing, um, that we generate on a quarterly basis. Um, because, because, well, we create an LLC um, during the escrow process so that the LLC um, buys the property. You own the LLC, the LLC buys the um, buys the property, the LLC enters into all of the contracts and agreements. So as far as everybody's concerned, they're dealing with the LLC. They have no idea who the owner of the LLC is. Um, and so we manage all aspects of the LLC for that uh, first year. We generate the um, quarterly um, um, financial statements, um, and if you're the only one owning the LLC, um, we um, give you everything that you need to give to your tax accountant for um, doing your um, taxes, because the LLC is a uh, pass-through entity as far as taxes. Um, if you decide to go in with another person or another entity, or if you decide to sell part of the LLC, um, then um, we issue K-1s at the end of the year to all of the um, owners. Um, and so um, we manage everything. You can be as involved or as, uh, hold on one moment. I think somebody's trying to get in, but I can't seem to find them. Hmm. Give me one quick moment while I try to see who's coming in. No, no problem. Huh, I'm not seeing nobody. Huh. I'll go back. Um, so, but you can be as involved as you want to. If you want to come out to um, Detroit and you want to look at properties, um, you can, or you can be as hands-off as you want to. Um, the one thing is we never, ever touch your money. You um, put your money into um, a bank account online. You um, give us the role of accountant so that we can see what's happening in the um, account. Um, we're able to um, request um, payments to vendors, um, but um, any payments out of your account are only done with your approval. We can't take any money out of your account. Um, so you have the final say so. We can make recommendations, but only you can say, yes, I'm gonna pay such and such, or I authorize this. Um, you are the only one that touch your money. We don't touch your money, okay? Um, so the entire process from um, the close of escrow to acquiring a tenant is typically around um, three months. Um, and um, if at the end of, of that time, you decide that you want to sell the property, um, add on another three months, so it could take you know a total of about um, six months. Now we do charge um, you know, some um, um, two percent fees. We charge two percent on the purchase, um, two percent on the rehab um, expenses, um, two percent um, on the gross uh, monthly um, rent, and two percent on the. Um, if you just uh, actually, I'm sorry, it's 4% on 
if you decide to sell it within our uh, within our network. Um, but we make the bulk of our money on the back end. Okay, whether you mm -hmm. sell it outright or you sell a large percentage of the LLC, because it's in an LLC, um, we actually prefer not to sell the property but to sell the underlining ownership of the LLC. Um, okay. And so um, and we put our money where our mouth is. We offer you a, a preferred rate of 10%. And what that means is you get to keep 100% of the profit up to 10% of your investment. And everything after that, we split 50-50. So if you mm -hmm. invest uh, $50,000, then the first $5,000 of profit is 100% yours. Anything after that then, we split 50-50. Um, if for whatever reason, um, we don't generate uh, at least that $5,000 in profit, we don't make any money off the back end. And um, as much as we enjoy doing this, we are not doing it for altruistic um, reasons. Uh, we are mm -hmm. doing it to, um, to generate profit, um, to encourage people to um, recycle their money, right? And, and, and we'll um, show you how much you can make as a traditional investor. So what we tell people is that we um, create turnkey rental um, investment properties on behalf of the investor. Um, again, you need $50,000. Uh, we also recommend $5,000 for contingency. So let's just say $55,000 available. Um, again, um, you get 100% of the profit up to 10% of what you invested. Anything above that is split 50-50. And so, excuse me, the traditional investor, um, our minimum amount that we look at selling an LLC for is $75,000. And that would be to someone in our investor network. And you might ask, well, how do you come up with the number of 75,000? So it's based on the um, average annual um, cash flow. Goes back to that, that $7,500 a year number, right? So if you want to understand from a cash flow perspective, how valuable is a property, you take the average annual cash flow and you divide it by what's called a cap rate. A cap rate is simply at what rate does an investment um, create free cash flow per year? And so if you buy a bond for $10,000 and it um, pays out um $500 in a year, it has a cap rate of 5% because it um, generates um, $500 per year. That's its capitalization rate. That's all cap rate is, right? It's how much free cash flow does an investment generate per year. And so um, here in Southern California, an acceptable cap rate for residential investors is three to 4%, which means if I invest $100,000, I'm happy with getting three to $4,000 in free cash flow, okay? That means if I invest $50,000, I'm happy with getting 1,500 to 2,000 dollars a year in free cash flow. So what happens when I tell an investor that I can get them $7,500 a year in free cash flow? Well, they're willing to pay a lot more money for that free cash flow. And so for our um, investors in our network, we use what's called a 10% cap rate. We tell them, hey, we can get you, you know, a 10% return on your money. Um, so 
Um, for $7,500 a year, you need to pay $75,000. And so um, the math works out real simple, right? So if we sell it for $75,000 and you went all in for $50,000, so that means $25,000 in profit. You get the first $5,000, so that means there's $20,000 to split. You get 10, we get 10. So now you got the first five and now you get another 10, which means you get a total of 15,000. And so that $15,000 on your $50,000 cash investment gives you a cash on cash ROI of 30% over a six month period. I'll say that again. That's a 30% cash on cash ROI over a six month period. That kills the stock market. Now you say, okay, Mike, sounds too good to be true. What's the worst case that could happen? And worst case that could happen is we can't sell it and you're forced to hold on to it and you're forced to make a 15% cash on cash return per year because you're only going to get $7,500 a year in net operating income from renting it. That's the worst case. That is literally the worst case. Uh, so okay. based just on that right there and what you've heard so far, what do you think so far? I'm still with you. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I said that's over a six month period. So you took your 50,000 and you turned it into 65,000. Now, what's the next move that you should do? You should take that $15,000, set it aside and not spend it. That's the crucial mm -hmm. thing that self discipline, not spend it. Take your original $50,000 and let's do it again. Mm -hmm. invest it again, go through the exact same thing. And in another six months, what will happen? You'll have another $15,000. And so that means in one year, off the same $50,000, you will have generated $30,000 in profit. Mm. Oh, well, let's see, Mike, now on an annual basis, that's a 60% cash on cash return without using any leverage, without using any loans. And that's the beautiful thing about mm -hmm. this model, right? It's math. Mm -hmm. It's math and it's risk management. How do you manage the risk? We developed a model that has low risk, high return, but as more people learn about it, as more people buy up properties in Detroit, they will push the prices up. And when as they push the prices up, the ROIs will come down. Okay. All right. So that's from the perspective of a traditional investor who has mm -hmm. $50,000. Well, there's also what's called a retail investor. A retail investor says, Mike, look, either I don't have the $50,000, I don't want to risk the $50,000, or I don't want to wait six months to get my um, return. Well, we call you a retail investor then, right? You just want to purchase the um, turnkey retail investment property once it's already been rehabbed and it's already generating monthly cash flow. Now, there is risk associated during that you know, three months of us finding the property, buying it distressed, rehabbing it, placing the tenant in. I'm not going to say that there's zero risk. What I can tell you is that we've developed a risk management system that minimizes the risk, identifies it, and uses processes, procedures, as well as algorithms to, to severely minimize those risks, in addition to being associated with a 
company on the ground that has 18 years, more than 300 properties of doing this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, but there's a lot less risk if you buy the finished product, right? So that's a retail investor. Yes, less risk. You're also going to get less reward. Those who take mm -hmm. the greatest amount of risks get the greatest amount of reward. Those who wait until all the risk is alleviated, oh, you're still going to get a handsome reward, just not as much. And mm -hmm. so um, this is, again, where you can get that 10% um, cap rate, 10% return, right? You invest $75,000, you get $7,500 a year, um, but it's an already performing um, asset. Mm -hmm. Also, our, when we start getting around the $75,000 price, you can now start bringing some loans in. At When we're uh, at the $50,000 all-in price for acquisition and for rehab, there aren't any traditional lenders that's going to lend you $50,000 for that. Okay. The, the loan the loan amount is too small, they say, for the amount of work they have to do. Um, it's the same amount of work, whether it's 50000 or whether it's 500000 It's the same amount of paperwork. Um, mm -hmm. We, though, are building a private um, investors network because we just looked at that as a huge opportunity, <laughs> right? And, and so uh, we are building our own, it's called a closed private investors network where we will be able to bring um, loans and we'll be able to bring a lot of leverage to where you'll only need to bring $5,000 and be able to borrow $45,000. And when you start bringing that amount of leverage, what leverage does is it increases the profit by a factor of the leverage. So if you mm -hmm. leverage 10 to 1, your profit increases by 10 times. So mm -hmm. that 30% turns into 300%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and because we are the ones that are managing the entire process and managing the risk, we basically underwrite the entire loan because of our processes. It, it puts us in a very unique position because we'll have our own internal lending program. So um, we'll probably be rolling that out um, beginning of next year. Um, mm -hmm. But in the meantime, um, as a retail investor, once you hit 75000 it does open up some opportunities. Um, and um, if you're outside of our network, hey, we're going to sell it to you. But now, instead of a 10% cap rate, we're going to use a lower cap rate, like a 9% cap rate. And when we use a lower percent cap rate, the value goes up. Mm -hmm. So still $7,500 a year of net operating income. But when you divide that $7,500 now, divided by 9%, now the value of the property is $83,333. That's when we sell it to somebody outside of our network, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And then the final part is because we're buying the properties in an LLC, we're actually um, able to offer fractionalized ownership because we can take the LLC and we can chop it up into member, member interest. And so um, we're, we're doing that um, with the property that we have right now, where we're selling it in um, chunks of $500. So the minimum investment is literally $500. Um, and uh, it's a win-win-win situation for everybody involved um, because the owner of the LLC um, in this case, it's a, it's a woman from LA, had never been to Detroit, had never owned um, investment real estate in her life. 
She put down the money, bought her first house, is generating $7,500 a year in that operating income. And she says, Mike, I want to sell 90% of the LLC. And we set it up to where she'll remain in con and she'll continue to own 10% and she'll remain in control of 100%, right? Everybody else is just along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And to plan to hold it for, for two more years, until this performing asset continues to perform a little bit longer, because the longer a performing asset continues to perform at the rate it's performing, the more valuable it becomes, which means the lower the cap rate, okay? And so she priced it at a 9% cap rate. So she priced her property at um, around $84,000, She's um, basically raising $75,000. So so, so um, she's raised um, a little bit over 35, you know, yeah, close to $35,000 so far. And so she's around halfway. Um, and um, she's going to be basically um, getting her money back that she invested, plus her profit still get 10% of the cash flow every quarter, still get 10% of the future appreciation, um, and she has 100% control over it. She has the has the best of both worlds. Um, and, and she's allowing other people to be able to participate in this for as little as $500, and they're earning, um, you know, 8.5% return um, per year. And in two years, if she sells the property um, using a 7% cap rate to where now she's selling the house for over $100,000, um, they'll get another 25% return on the back. Hmm. And, 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 and here's the interesting thing and another reason why we pick uh, Detroit. Um, Detroit has the highest um, population of Arabic speaking people in the United States. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so there's a huge influx, millions of dollars coming in from the Middle East to buy up rental properties in Detroit. And they're willing to pay a 7% cap rate because that's what they're used to getting um, back in the Middle East. But they see um, U.S. Uh, properties as appreciating at a, at a uh, quicker um, rate than in the Middle East mm -hmm. and, and being more um, secure. So there's an influx of Middle East money. <laughs> mm. right? So it's like Detroit is like the perfect storm. Right. Things. Mm. And so uh, the very last thing I want to show you is the, 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 the property that we're selling um, the, um, the, the partial interest in. It's, and we name every um, property after the address. So this is the address, 17917 McKay Street. Um, and we're doing a crowdfunding raise. And so it's uh, offered by a FINRA-approved crowdfunding um, website. And when you go to the website, this is what it looks like. And it tells you the type of, of uh, security, its membership interest. Expect to hold it for two years. Right now, we're at an 8.5% annual cash-on-cash cash return. Um, you get a proportion um, of the uh, quarterly net operating income uh, after we set aside money for taxes, insurance, uh, property management, as well as reserves. And the exit strategy is to sell. This gives you, you know, the pitch and the offering and everything like that. But these are the two most important documents.
and I'm going to put the link to this in the chat so that you can easily reference it. Um, but this form C, which is 66 pages, has all the disclosures. It's almost as um, involved. It's 90% of what would be prepared for a public offering. Okay, it's that detailed. Um, but um, oh, are you able to see my screen still or not? Uh, what are you showing? Because I do see you. Oh no, I was I was actually sharing showing you the um. This is the this is the flyer. I'm sorry. Oh, this is oh. yeah. This is the the flyer for our um one seven nine one seven McKay Street property. Okay, and then it has the link to the um website that's hosted on the crowdfunding um website, mm -hmm. um which is uh, a um black owned FINRA approved um crowdfunding uh, company and then this is what the website looks like and then this is a snapshot of the offering this then goes into the pitch the offering but these are the two important documents the pitch deck and then this is the form c which is um, filed and approved with the SEC mm -hmm. um, and, and has all the um, disclosures. Um, and so tomorrow technically is the last day if you want to buy through the FINRA approved website. But in addition, to offering it through the crowdfunding offering, we are also doing a private offering in which there is no uh, closing date on the um, private offering. Um, and the crowdfunding laws have certain restrictions on them uh, versus the uh, private offerings uh, have much looser um, restrictions. Um, there's no limit to um, how much you can buy. Um, you just have to be a uh, sophisticated investor. And if you're not an accredited investor, um, we basically make you a sophisticated investor by taking you through our class, um, which is called um, what to look for when evaluating an investment opportunity. And then there's a test, a quiz, not a little test, but 10 questions that you need to, to get at least a 70% on in order to um, prove um, that you've understood the um, material. And then we can classify you as a sophisticated investor. So I do want to be respectful of your time. Um, but if you have any questions, um, I'm available to answer them. Uh, no, I think I am good. Uh, the presentation, was that, will that be available later? Or yeah, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, follow up with an email. It'll have uh, both of the presentations. It'll have the flyer, it'll have the um, link to the crowdfunding um, um, website. Um, so yeah, it'll have all the information as, as well as a link if you want to, you know, have a follow-up um, one-on-one Zoom session mm -hmm. um, to discuss any further. All right, I think I'm good. Because uh, I am actually um, going to be part of a team, so I got to run this by them as well, so. Okay, and then what I'll do is I'll also um, shoot to the, um, the link where um, this will be um, uploaded onto our um, YouTube um, channel. And so um, they'll be able to view um, this and, and um, previous um, webinars 
because each webinar is slightly different according to the participants. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And the um, crowdfunding site, which site was that again? Um, it's called secureliving.com. And I'll, and I'll, I'll shoot oh, you okay. the, the, gotcha. the, the okay. link to that also. All right. All right, sir. Well, um, um, I think I'm good for the time being. Um, unless you have anything else. No, nah, man. I just want to, you know, I just want to um, thank, thank you for taking the time out of your Sunday um, night. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to, um, you know, come to the webinar and uh, uh, look forward to having some future conversations with you. Andrew. Uh, Oh, much appreciated. Oh, do have um, sort of a slightly related question about Detroit in particular. Um, the last I heard, they were shrinking the city. Ah, so here's an interesting fact. So in the 1950s, Detroit population topped out at about two and a half million people. And right. then mm -hmm. for 66 straight years, it went into decline until 2023. 2023 was the first year in 20 in 66 years um, that Detroit population has not declined. 2023 was the first year in 66 years that there was an increase in the population. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. So, yeah, I think, when you um, when you look at all perfect. indicators, the um, Detroit has bottomed out. Okay, so the report that I saw a couple of years ago, they said they were um, they were mowing down a lot of the um, the boarded up housing, and they were not going to build anymore. At least that's what the report said. Ah, so there was a proposition. I think it's Proposition M, that was like two hundred fifty million dollars mm -hmm. in order to um, tear down boarded up houses. Because right. that's how they got that's how they got seventy thousand vacant lots is by oh, is by, gotcha. is by um you know um uh, tearing down um vacant um um boarded up homes um mm -hmm. but I can actually this is interesting because let's see hopefully I have this in my clipboard uh, and if so I'll be able to just post it let me see. Uh, I don't, but I will also, uh, I'll share with you a recent um, article out of the um, most recent emailing from the city mm -hmm. about the $1 billion investment that the city is doing to increase the number of um, low income housing um, built in the city. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Well, that was just something that happened to pop in my brain as I was listening. I was just wondering because I heard I've heard conflicting reports about Detroit. Yeah, I, but I but but I I can I can testify and I'll, like so I'll send you the the, the news article that mm -hmm. um, Detroit has bottomed out economically, and that the jobs are coming back, that they are good paying um, jobs. They are focused on the EV industry. They're focused on the financial um, industry. Um, hmm. And the whole city is focused on renewable energy from an infrastructure perspective. Mm -hmm. Speaking of infrastructure, um, I'm assuming they uh, um, they rectify some of the water issues around there. Yeah, so the water issues were in were in were in Flint, Michigan. Um, had didn't have anything to do with the city of um, Detroit itself. That was a Flint issue. Yeah, but I thought I heard. I thought I read that um, in addition to Flint, there was a few other jurisdictions, and I'm almost sure Detroit was mentioned. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, I've, 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 uh, I've spent the last five years in the water industry here in Southern mm -hmm. California. Um, and so, as you can imagine, Flint um, was um, a huge discussion point. Um, mm -hmm. And and so outside of 
Flint because Flint was just mismanagement. It was mm -hmm. it was hundred percent just mismanagement of their system. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, the um, um, Detroit's um, water, which is an independent, um, separate um, water mm -hmm. system, was was not um, affected. Uh, so was uh, Flint use at one point using um, the Detroit system? So they, they, they may have been getting they, they may have been getting some some of their um, water when they because they were having problems with their own water. They may yeah. have uh, made an agreement with um, Detroit to use um, um, Detroit's treated water as a source mm -hmm. of water for mm -hmm. Flint residents. Now that's a okay. strong possibility. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Uh, just wondering. All right. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, I do appreciate the presentation and look forward to the follow up emails because I'm. I've been interested in Detroit for a while. I just wasn't quite sure what was really going on because I didn't have any boots on the ground, as you say. And that's the most important thing. <laughs> or else you're going to yeah. get hustled. <laughs> you're going to get hustled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, sir. Much appreciated. All right. You're very welcome. You have a blessed night. You as well. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.